The Koi Gig Pod and OTB Sports in association with Cadbury. A player and a half deserves a glass and a half of support. Everyone ran their socks off tonight and they left everything out there. We're very proud of the, the team's performance. Let the shackles off Katie a bit so that she can go and play her game. We're going to go out there to beat them. We're going to try and beat them. Hello there and welcome along to the latest episode of the Koi Gig Pod, the new home of everything Women's Super League and women's football on Off The Ball. I'm Kathleen McNamee and alongside me each week will be former Ireland international and current Piment United player Karen Duggan. Karen, we were a little worried you weren't going to turn up today for a recording. (laughs) (laughs) I was nearly not. Um, How are we? That's a loaded question. Um, I suppose in the history books for being having part of one of the biggest implosions ever seen in (laughs) women's sport. Um, Yeah, obviously. A really, really bad couple of weeks as a P-Mount United player. Two opportunities to to win the league, um, underperformed in both games. Obviously not taken away from Shelburne. They had a job to do. They had to win their last two games. They did that as expected. We were expected to win and we didn't do it. So um, it does. It feels like a league, a league lost rather than a, a Shelburne win to me, obviously. But those girls are obviously delighted. And I, I live with uh, Amanda Budden, the Shelburne goalkeeper. So I've been keeping her distance <laughs> for a couple of days. Still a bit raw. <laughs> I was going to say, what's that like? Are you kind of passing each other in the kitchen? Being... I actually think she nearly feels sorry for me. It's, it was that <laughs> bad of an implosion. like, And my own performance was absolutely scandalous as well. So I have nothing to hide behind. Um, yeah, it'll be a long time licking her wounds after that one. Um, you nearly just want to start the league again after something like that happens. But then again, I think I think a mental break is needed to um, make matters worse. My Camogie team lost the county final by a point the following day. So a great weekend all around. <laughs> oh, gosh, no. OK, well, anyone who's listening to this, please send Karen some big love over the next week, because I think that's more heartbreak than one person should have to. Oh, sport, it's why we love it and why we hate it. Exactly. I, I I wonder even how you would have felt if you'd won one and lost the other, because then it still probably would have, I'd have surely felt better than this. This is awful. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's the dr- drowning your sorrow sessions aren't as good as the, as the league winning sessions. So the hangover I have compared to Amanda's are, are very very different ones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Well, we might do a little bit more Women's National League just to look at the season so far in a second before we preview the or we'll look at back at the week that was Mm -hmm. in the WSL as well. Um, But just in terms of what you're expecting from this podcast, the Koi Gig Pod and OTB Sports is in association with Cabri FC, official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland's women's national team. Every week we will be here in your podcast feeds, talking everything from the Women's Super League to the Irish national team with latest views, analysis and reaction to the biggest and breaking stories. Uh, We'll also have our team of the week, which is coming later in the show, provided by OTB's Emma Carroll and each week we'll have a feature interview with some of the top names in the world of Irish women's football. This week, it's very exciting, we have Colones and Ireland's Amber Barish in the Koi Gig hot seat, so looking forward to chatting to her a bit later on. Um, but I suppose just to like dive into the league, and I'll, I'll try and not push you too much <laughs> on the, the heartbreak side of things, but last season was so unusual with covid and everything mm-hmm. this season we've seen such mass things like the, the fact you can actually watch the games on tg Cahir, which is great reflecting on the season final weekend aside how has it been i think it's definitely been the most successful season of the women's national league in terms of the the coverage um the, the kind of shock results and stuff that we've seen it, it's piqued people's interests a lot more than than previous years and i think that is down to things like the coverage um, thought the TG Cahir coverage was fantastic at the weekend. Obviously, they were at both stadiums. It was really impressive the commitment that they put into to showing those games. And um, I think that will have encouraged them and maybe other networks as well to look at at showing more games. So for me, that's a huge part of the progress. It's it's all about exposure. And um, because we've always had good talent in the league, you can see that from the players that we've produced and we're sending over to the WSL now. Um, most of those girls have come through the Women's National League. So the standard is there and it's good that people are getting to see it more and more often. LOI TV was excellent. Um, 
So there's still, a, obviously, it's it's like a lot of the women's leagues in Europe where it's, there's a disparity between the top and the bottom, but that's that's the case in professional leagues. We see hammer-ins happen in the WSL week in, week out. They happen in the Women's National League and people nearly turn their noses up at that. But even the French men's league, you have results like that. So that's, that's a given um, when you have a league that's just kind of 10 teams. Um, but teams are definitely improving, I think. Galway since they got their new manager in obviously their performance is fresh in my head but I've definitely seen strides in them from the start of the season to the end of the season so it's encouraging for next year as well similarly with DLR I think everyone's noted the progress that they've made and um, then the top three were, were the top three at the end and, and fighting it out to the death and again we have a cup final to look forward to next week um, I think that'll be really competitive between Wexford and Shelburne. Yeah definitely and I think what I have seen really in, I don't know I just see a way more people talking about it than mm -hmm. ever before and the fact that like people are reaching out to me and saying oh Kathleen like where can I watch this match or I see that there's a really big title race happening this weekend mm -hmm. like what do I need to know who are the players I should watch and I've never really had that from people around the league before in the same way and this is I suppose the kind of the whiff of uh, different types of people that have been coming forward and wanting to know more and even in a professional capacity I don't think I've ever seen this sort of hype and like you said it made it so much better that it was well for us neutrals it made it so much better <laughs> that it was such a dramatic finish like I was working Ireland New Zealand mm. and I kind of was just coming home as it was all like properly kicking off and I saw the scores and I was like wait what <laughs> You and me both, Kathleen. You and me <laughs> both couldn't believe what was unfolding before my eyes. Um, but yeah, like you say, people are just their interest is peak now. And I think it's it's showing the players. You see the likes of Savannah McCarthy getting into the international scene. And I think that I, I'm not saying that people don't watch the matches not enough, but like when we put the highlights and stuff on Twitter, their names are out there, their names are spoken about more and more. And you nearly have to be spoken about in this country on social media to get an opportunity in the squad and she's someone who's done that and taken the opportunity with both hands and she seems to be in Vera Powell starting 11 now which is a huge achievement because last year she was nowhere near the, the panel and this year she's starting and ahead of Diane Caldwell at the moment which is obviously a talking point because Diane is such a, a stalwart in that team for such a long time but again it just shows that when you show interest in the players and in the league you can uncover some really good talent and I think there's more to be uncovered. Definitely. And it's something that's come up quite a bit while we've been doing this show, the whole idea of, you know, making the league more professional and bringing it to the next level. Something like Katie McCabe chatted about it last week. You can check out that episode if you're fancy it on the OTB app. But and I suppose something actually that might be interesting to talk to Emma Barrett about later, because obviously she's gone from the Women's National League to a professional league in the Frauen Bundesliga. But how far away do you think that is? How far? And like, as a player, what are the sort of movements that are happening in the league? It's it's still a good bit off, if, if I'm being honest. When you look at attendances and things like that, there's no way for clubs to, to generate money. They're still very much amateur and dependent on volunteers. Um, I think when you see the, the amalgamation of the women's clubs and the men's clubs, similarly to how it has gone in the WSL, that that's probably going to be a next step. Um, where they can use each other's resources and things like that. In the meantime, in terms of development of players, I think that unfortunately the clubs are given all they can. So I think that there has to be an interim thing put in place. And for me, that's regular home-based sessions, whether they're regional or they're just based in Dublin and Abbottstown, but they have to be consistent. Um, you can't ask someone's trainer who's probably a dad or, or looking after a family who's doing things on a voluntary basis to train a team four nights a week. They need they need help uh, and that has to come from the higher ups in the FAI and hopefully that is going to start coming. Um, that's what I want to see in terms of it going semi-professional again, it's going to come from the higher ups. So we're, we're just kind of waiting for that. But again, the more they push attendances, the more they push um, standards, we're going to have club licensing and stuff in place for next year. Like all of those things add to the professionalism and the attitude of the girls is very professional. Um, so we just need it's, it's going to be financial unfortunately that's that's the, the crux of of it at the end of the day you need investment but we've seen the sponsors starting to come into the irish women's team now um there's a big focus on that so if some of that could trickle into the league um it's it's really going to help us i think yeah definitely even seeing things like as well i'm i'm from sligo and i saw like sligo rovers mm. announced their women's team and it was it was such a weird moment for me because 
I came from very much like a GAA community. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Sligo Rovers, when I was growing up, were such a massive team. There used to be bus stop tours through the town. I remember the lads would come into, I went to an all girls school, they'd come in, show us trophies. Everyone was going wild. I was just thinking back on that time and like how unfortunate it was that that wasn't capitalized on because I know so many of my friends would have been GAA and hockey players because there just wasn't that option even with club football around the county in the same way to play. So I suppose them coming on board now, even if it was a little bit conflicting, but it has taken so long is a good sign for where the league is headed. It is. It's, it's shown that the participation is increasing. I would have been the same, like obviously growing up in Kilkenny, we would have lost a lot of very good soccer players to Camogie. And that's fair enough because that, that was what was pushed. That was what was in their faces. And unfortunately, you just have to get it in people's faces um, and get them at it from an early age. And I think Sligo have a good underage setup. I think that that's going to be important. I think any of the teams who are successful in, in senior football do have a good, strong structure there. And we've seen Galway appoint a CEO, which is amazing just for the women's side of the game. Um, so all of those things are they're brilliant to see. And, and hopefully it'll start to spread around the country because probably do need more teams in the league, um, a, a bigger spread, I think, at some point maybe an all Ireland league could be something that's spoken about because we've seen obviously massive development in Northern Ireland the fact that they qualified for the Euros a lot of girls who are going professional now but even themselves in the country in Northern Ireland and the clubs that they have they're going from strength to strength they have a really strong home base set up there something we could probably emulate a little bit better so I think that that could be something that's spoken about again in the future I just think there's so much scope for development in this country and I think now it's a hot topic and a good time to to jump on board. Definitely. And you mentioned earlier about like now just wanting to get back into the league, but probably being a good thing to have that little bit of time yeah. and say, <laughs> breathe. But how do you go about like picking yourself up after that? When you, like, as you said yourself, it was pretty much like the last few weeks, uh, just a bit of an implosion from PMAP by all accounts. So, like, how do you go about working through that? Is it as a team? Is it individually? You know, who was standing up in the dressing room afterwards saying, we're okay we'll get through this or was it just silence (laughs) yeah like we're because of covid we're all split out into four dressing rooms anyway so the the dressing rooms are are only a few of us in it um but yeah it was just it was quiet um I think we need a few days just to to step away and reflect um Anya O'Gorman she's she's the best captain I've ever played under she's amazing so she's put messages in the group and and she's we've been in contact and yeah, we'll we'll be going again because we can't end we can't end like that. The two of us have been in the league for a long time now, but you, you can't sign off like that. So um yeah, there's look, it just shows that we had room to develop. We were possibly too dependent on on individuals, maybe and we underestimated the fact that we were champions for the last two years and teams they, they study and they figure out how to play against you. And unfortunately, they figured it out at the latter end of the season when we maybe just ran out of steam, like we can make excuses with injuries, illnesses, all that sort of stuff. But every team faces those. So it's about overcoming that. Um, but yeah, a break is needed. It's been a long three years on the road for us in particular. Um, obviously, we had cup finals, which we lost and then won and Champions League, which we were close in one year and then not the next and all the ups and downs that came with that. So I think in particular, it, it's time for, for a female definitely need to, to shut off um, and a step away. I think it would be healthy for us to banish it from our memories. <laughs> <laughs> I won't torture you anymore by asking too much, but I do hope you get a bit of a break and you're able to at least see some of the highs from the rest of the season that you did enjoy. Um, <laughs> alongside, obviously, our own league, we also have the Women's Super League was mm-hmm. ongoing. Some very interesting results at the weekend. Um, I don't know if there's one in particular that stood out to you. I mean, North London Derby is probably... No, North London yeah. Derby. I mean, the Arsenal, as I said before, they've been rampant um, from the beginning of the season. Um, they were like steam train. They just didn't look like anyone would be able to stop them. And in the first half... They played some really excellent football, but Spurs stuck to their task. They really, really frustrated them. And and they made Arsenal look pretty ordinary at times then in the second half. And um, to be honest, if they had snuck the win, you wouldn't have begrudged it on them because of just the sheer effort that they put in. But then, of course, Vivian Medima at the end, at the death, um, what a header that was. And, and our own Katie McKay providing the assist, which was amazing again. But uh, it was actually a tough day for Katie. Um, they, she had a real battle down that left wing um, 
with Neville. So that was intriguing to see. We got to see some of the bite we're used to seeing in, in those Irish games from her. Yeah, she really did. I, I like before going into the match, I would have said that Katie definitely would have had her measure like as a player. Yeah. So it was, I think it does show what Skinner has done with Tottenham and the fact that she has brought like several of those individual players. And even because you look at the players that they had last season, some of them from an on, at an international level anyways, you probably would consider a bit better than the squad that's there. But she's done an amazing job at bringing them up. And I thought it was interesting seeing Arsenal get that frustrated because mm. we haven't really seen them do that. I, there was the Barcelona game, but that I think that was more shell shock, whereas this was yeah. a team that they were clearly better than frustrating them quite a lot I thought there was some interesting comments as well from Adeval after the game um talking about the refereeing in the match and he was basically like as a fellow professional you know if you don't have anything nice to say don't say anything at all um I don't know what your take is on that I I didn't see I didn't see too much in it I thought that most some of the challenges even that were given against maybe Neville were a little bit harsh I thought it was good honest tackling I think as a team where you know you're not going to dominate possession you do all you can to frustrate the opposition and I thought they did that perfectly and yeah it might not be pretty to look at but if I'm on that Spurs team I'm going to want to make my mark on those big name players I'm going to want to try and frustrate them because they've had a time of it for the first five games of the season so um, it'll stand to Arsenal in the long run but um, yeah they were definitely a little bit shocked that they they didn't convert some of those chances in the first half and really had to, to keep fighting then right to the death. Yeah, it was interesting. So even Skinner saying after the match, she was a bit like, oh, yeah, it was an all right result, like a bit disappointing to us. And I was like, they, like they've never beaten Arsenal in the Women's Super mm, League. It was aggregate. historic, really. Yeah. 11-1 to Arsenal across all the matches, like incredible. But I suppose it probably just shows what sort of mentality she has brought to that team that she's like, yeah, it's a good result. But like, you know, we she wants play. more and more, yeah. which is great to see because um. God, they are the surprise package so far. They they don't look like a team who are ever going to be torn apart um, by any of those top teams. And they've got some amazing attacking talent, obviously, in Arsenal and, and Chelsea. But yeah, they don't look as vulnerable as, as other teams who are exposed to those talents. They, they look like they're, they're really well organised and that's testament to how they're being coached. Yeah, and I suppose the other big one as well that would be important to touch on was a, a former top of the table clash, which is now a top table slash bottom table clash with Man Crazy. City and Chelsea, a 4-0 defeat for them. So pretty resounding defeat. I thought it was really strange some of the things that Gareth Taylor was saying after the match, the city manager, he was saying, you know, we showed lots of positives. The two, the Arsenal game where they lost and the, the Chelsea game were just complete freak accidents practically. And I think anyone who's, and again, he was blaming the injuries and stuff, but I think anyone who's watched the city team, you know, you can say like, okay, you have some bad injuries, but also some of the performances have just been terrible. Just they just look so so vulnerable at the back. It looks like any team could score against them um, anytime they attack. And yeah, they have injuries and, and goalkeeping worries and, and things like that. But when you do that, you you, sh- you set yourself up to be solid in the first ten minutes. And and they're giving back passes and giving goals away in the first two minutes. And and just silly sloppy mistakes. And they had a chance to go one all when they were just one nil down. But then the floodgates just opened. And yeah, they just look really really vulnerable and even with injuries you just you just have to find a way um a way to to stem the flow because at the moment they're on a really downward trajectory they're the second worst defense in the league and they had the second best last season so you just got to get on get them on the training pitch and just sort that out don't worry about your attack get everyone behind the ball as long as it's going to sort that out um they might need to rethink the way they play football the real possession based football they might need to start being a little bit more direct and just a little bit less pleasing on the eye because these results are they're not, they're not good for anyone in the club and and it's it's that was a real thumping at the weekend obviously Chelsea or Chelsea um some great talent on show G in particular was running the show there but um yeah the focus you're you're talking about City after a game like that which is mad I know and I think mm-hmm. as well it shows because Erin Cuthbert was on Lauren Hemp and she very much shut down Lauren Hemp who's an incredible player and it just showed that how limited City's choices appear to be at this stage in the season which again, not something that you ever would have said about City in the past. The fact that she was taken completely out of the game, they were just, they had no idea what to do. They had no place to go in the whole match. Yeah, and like I was saying, teams figure out how to play against you and they haven't changed the way they play in a while. Um, They've gotten those injuries and they don't have the depth when you look at the benches. Like we mentioned it before, Arsenal's bench is so stacked um, compared to the likes of City now at the moment. 
Uh, but obviously we have to give some credit to Chelsea as well that they played like played like champions, I guess. Um, but yeah, City made it pretty easy for them as well. Yeah, as well as one final result, just give a quick shout to it would be the Everton United one. Really interesting. Two teams that are in very different positions from previous years. Um, probably a fair result in the end. One I'd say Everton would probably be more happy with than United. Yeah, I think United in the manner that they conceded that goal. Um the, the mix up at the back was was a bit of a calamity and um, that's kind of two weeks in a row we're maybe looking at the United goalkeeper for not dominating her area um, well enough she's a great shot stopper but that might be something that they'd look at in that position I want my goalkeeper screaming at my defender I'd clear you want her clearing man ball everything going through them and she just was a little bit tepid and they paid the ultimate price with that goal but I think Everton probably deserved it on the balance of things um, it was a, a, a solid performance and and you can tell that they're they're buying into Jean Luc. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how they develop because I think they have the players to develop and be an exciting team to watch. So um, hopefully we'll see more of that in the coming weeks. Me too. Well, if you have any suggestions, opinions, or thoughts on the podcast, or even let us know what your favorite moments were from the women's national league season. Maybe not too many Anthony Mount ones, just so the first half of the season. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do get us on Twitter at off the ball using the hashtag OTB Koi Gig. Now, it wouldn't be the Koi Gig pod if we didn't have our team of the week with OTB's Emma Carroll. Uh, Emma, you were set up on a couple of different devices last week. I presume the same thing was headed this week. Uh, how did you find rating all the teams? It was an exciting weekend of football. It was a busy weekend, yeah. Very busy weekend of football. Um, yeah, shall we just get into it? I'll, yeah, I'll please do. Here. Give us yeah. your team. <laughs> so, goalkeeper, we have uh, Spurs' Corpella. At the back, we've Katie McCabe, Magdalena Eriksson, Anita Asante, and Ashley Neville. Midfield, Kenza Daly, Kit Graham, and G. And up front, Ella Toon, Miedema, and Aaron Cuthbert. It's probably one of the most like diverse team-wise team of the week so that we've ever had. There's a lot of different players in there. I suppose the thing that stuck out to me was how many Spurs players there were in it. Uh, obviously, they had an incredible result at the weekend, but... What was your particular thinking behind, say, players like Neville, especially because I know she's had some difficulties in the league. She had a very good game up against one of the best who was also on your team of the week. But what was it about her that stuck out? It probably my points probably will contradict themselves a little bit here because um, McKay did play four to fours in the North London Derby and was up head to head with Neville. But um, I thought Neville was excellent, apart from probably the chance that she could have just had a tap in. Um, it would have really capped off her day but um, Spurs were brilliant they were really solid against Arsenal I didn't know how Arsenal had got more goals in the first half to be honest um, it was bizarre but uh, which is why Corpella is also in the team of the week because she made some outstanding saves um, but yeah I thought Neville up against McCabe she really kept her quiet it was probably McCabe's most quiet game of the season so far I'd say but she's still done a bit and she got the assist for the last minute equaliser. So that's why Katie's still in the team as well. Yeah, and it was a great, yeah, was no better woman to pop up with a goal then than Vivian Miedema to save the day. Um, yeah. Anytime you watch her, she's she's just outstanding. Like you can't fault her. She'd be disappointed she didn't get more goals, but I just thought her movement and her feet were uh, just such a joy to watch. Yeah, I thought Miedema was brilliant on Saturday. She seemed to be quite angry and new hairstyle and she just <laughs> her movement was everywhere and um, yes and to pop up just McCabe corner header it's the two people that you want to stand up to get yeah. a last minute equalizer and they did that did just that as well to uh, save Arsenal from their first defeat of the season and it was almost vaguely upsetting watching Miedema with the like ponytail coming out rather than the tight <laughs> button I wasn't used to it at all <laughs> I was like who is that player on the pitch um, someone who I thought like maybe earned like a shout in in the team of the week was Claire Emsley for Everton. Obviously, Everton had like quite a decent result against United. They've had a really tough start to their season, but I think she's been a player who's been quite consistent and she had a really good shot on goal. Probably should have scored, but was just kind of unlucky in the whole thing. Um, but yeah, I thought she was really impressive and I saw a bit of a change in Everton this week, which I enjoyed. Yeah, I thought her um, and Kenza Daly, who makes this team, was probably the two outstanding players for Everton. Um, yeah, the chances that they made. And I think Daly really, her delivery was excellent. Um, even at one point, I think um, 
Christensen was pulled off a free kick, but you could just kind of hear the sounds of somebody shouting at her to go, uh, no, you're not you're not having this one. Uh, Dali, go ahead and take it. Um, and the delivery of it was obviously the reason why. Um, excellent on the day. And I think she was player of the match as well. So I thought she deserved um, a spot on the team. It, there's, there's some players that we normally wouldn't talk about a lot this week, but I, I think they really shown through. Like Kit Graham as well. We've already mentioned Tottenham. Tottenham a lot went through her. Um, and they kind of kept the likes of Little Little and Manum at bay yeah. really it was the quietest was I've seen that Arsenal first, team first time I've seen Little quiet um, yeah. in a game uh, and yeah I think that they they really missed her kind of cutting edge and that is largely down to how Spurs operate in that midfield I thought they were really really impressive yeah and then yeah um, Cuthbert keeps her place I thought she was brilliant for Chelsea um, kept Lauren Hemp Again, another player that's been outstanding this season, really, really quiet. Um, and Ella Toon scored a brilliant goal for Manchester United and looked very lively across the day as well. So they kind of complete the team. But um, I could have had any number of Chelsea players in there, I think. I think Fleming was brilliant, Kirby, Kerr, um, Gur Wrighton as well. So it was a bunch of Chelsea players that you could have got in there. But I think... Um, I think some people just were worth a shout this week. Yeah, I think Emma Hayes singled out Cuthbert as well because she was asked to operate in that kind of deeper um, right back position and she did a job, but she was so brilliant going forward as well. So it was good to see someone like that getting praised because they have so much flair, but she was, it was work rate as well. That was really um, standing out from her. So she's definitely justified in her position. But like you say, Chelsea were, were fairly rampant at the weekend against uh, an underperforming Man City squad. Yeah, I was going to ask because you've been accused of Chelsea bias in the past. So does that like <laughs> temper your team of the week in any way? I quite enjoyed this because there was like a lot of nice choice in it. But like, were you thinking about that when you were lining up your team? Um, Yeah, but there's still three Chelsea players in there and Ericsson, G and Cuthbert. So <laughs> it's a bit like Arsenal last week. We had a bit of, fair bit of Arsenal in there last week and there's probably more players that you could put in. But I think try to get a balance and it's just shine a light on some of the players that we don't normally talk about who performed outstandingly over the weekend I think uh, just edged their way forward into the team because there is weeks where we'll always get to talk about Kerr and Kirby <laughs> that's true always I was happy to see G in the team again as well I know I talked about her last week but I just think that she is one of the most underrated players in the league like every she's on the ball all the time she's setting up attacks she is like the person that allows Kerr and Kirby to basically flourish and be the amazing forwards that they are. Um, so I'm always happy to see her getting a shout in. I think it's really interesting looking at your team and seeing that midfield of G, Graham and Dally, because I don't think it's the sort of like classic midfield that any WSL person or someone who watches the WSL a lot would pick out. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's really different to, yeah, as I said, like the likes of Little didn't make it this week, Bet Mead. They just, I think it's the standards that they've set themselves this season. They just didn't quite live up to those standards. Um, yeah, and it just gives other people a shot. Well, thanks for that, Emma. Uh, you'll be back next week, hopefully, with even more coveted positions on the team of the week. Uh, if you have any thoughts or opinions on the team that we have, well, Emma has selected this week. Please let us know. You can get us all on Twitter at Off the Ball and make sure to use the hashtag OTB Koi Gig. Now, I am very excited to say it's time we brought in our special guest for this week's Koi Gig pod, Ireland and FC Colons, Amber Barrett. Amber, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. I hope you guys are well. Yeah, we're doing well. Some better. Us- <laughs> <laughs> were you watching at the weekend or following along? Following along, yes. Um, traumatically, I might add, but yes, following along. <laughs> yeah, poor Karen, we've already given her a bit of a, a run through about the whole thing. What's it like being far away and kind of watching these games, especially with so many people you would have played with? Do you know what? Actually, I think the, the format of the league this year with the access to League of Ireland TV has been brilliant. Um, I've actually spent most of the weekends watching different games over the week um over the weekends but I think as well since TG Kahar have come in it's been brilliant I think the way the last few weeks have really there's just been a really good build up to things and as much as a few weeks ago it kind of looked like the league was heading towards P Mount and everything I think the way the TG Kahar have I think the the promos and everything have really you know made it a really exciting 
um, end to the season. And then obviously then that was complemented with the, well, uncomplimented with the football as well. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, we were just talking about this earlier and saying how much easier it is for everyone to access it, how much better the product is. And hopefully that it's just a sign of like a growing professionalism within the league. Um, obviously you had the international break and now you're back playing club football. How has that been for you? Yeah, the last few weeks we've had a couple of very difficult games. Um, we had a very good victory last week. We beat Leverkusen, which is the which is kind of like the, the local derby. And I think being involved in games like this and you know getting a good result is always something that the club are so are so passionate about. And you know, of all the all the teams you play against, it's Leverkusen is always the big one. And I think going up to Leverkusen and beating them in their own backyard was such a, a huge, you know, huge result. Um, but unfortunately we were knocked out of the cup by Potsdam a few weeks ago and then obviously over the weekend then we also managed to get beat by Potsdam but also the standard of players in the league is, is very very high so I think when you have teams like that that you know you're not going to win every single game that you you come into. Yeah and what's it been like coming back up into the top division like um, do you notice the, the change in standards straight away like is it completely different is it is it kind of similar to what we see in other countries where the top league is, is very much the top league for a reason and then the rest are, are lagging behind WSL2 is obviously growing and getting a lot better but I think in most other countries it is just that top division and and that's where you see all the best talent yeah I think so I think that you know obviously we went through the league the second league last year and we had you know really really good results um, I think by one game where we we drew against um, Frankfurt second team, you know, we had won every game up to that point. And I think we were definitely by far the strongest team in the league. And I think that when you come in then and you, you know, the first couple of games we played Essen, then straight away in the first game in the Bundesliga, then we played Bayern, then we played Wolfsburg, then we played Hoffenheim. <laughs> It was a wake up, system, a, wake, yeah. a wake up call, if anything, and I think. But that's as you said. There's such a there is a difference between standards between first and second leagues. I would certainly say the WSL is probably the best example of one mm-hmm. that seems to be closing the gap, and I think that's really important for teams that are in the second league. They need to be getting themselves as close to even if it's the bottom half teams in the first league for for being able to stay up and then compete, obviously, in the league. Yeah, the WSL has become a really attractive place for European players to come and play as well. What was it um, about Germany that attracted you um, in the first place? Colin, give me no choice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. This what I, I wanted to go away. And you could have done what I did and retired. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't high enough up in the center for me to be able to do that there. <laughs> But uh, no, I think just with Colin, he was just, he obviously wanted me to go away and I spoke to him about it. And I was lucky in the sense that he had a very good relationship with the coach in Cologne at the time. And I think in that regard, I'm very lucky. And obviously the last couple of years have been very good here. And, you know, I think it's nice to actually go out of the comfort zone a little bit, even if the language is a really horrendous thing to try and learn every day. But um, that's a small, it's a small thing to take. How far along are you in the language? <laughs> Like honestly, I, I definitely much much better. It is still a little bit weird listening to someone from Donegal speak with German, you know, say German things. Um, but I think it's definitely that that you pick up things along the way through training and different things. And I think just sometimes there's an over expectation that you should know a little bit more than what you do. But it's obviously like when you haven't really done any German and you come into the it's kind of like as Karen said earlier, like a shock to the system. Then you kind of sometimes you just have to pick it up as you go because it's either that or you really really struggle to understand anything that's going on yeah I have absolutely no like proper comparison but I know whenever I like talk to international players and say English isn't their first language the only thing I can relate it to is watching sport on TG Cahir like the games at the weekend like the rugby like the camogie and stuff and just casually picking up a few words every so often and I was like I can't imagine actually going into a training situation where you need to understand very clear rules or like has the setup of a drill or where you're supposed to be moving or whatever it is compared to me just sitting at home on my couch being like oh that means it's a try or oh that means there's a free or whatever it is yeah I think though with with football as well though like when it's it's quite universal language in the sense of you know 
you pick things up naturally that obviously new words and vocabulary are obviously part and parcel of it but like movements positions are all you know they're on there's a lot of that is unspoken it's kind of you know where to move you look at something and I find that sometimes I still need to see something first and then to be able to do it and that's English or German I've even found when we go into camp that there's might be a, we're doing an exercise and I might need to see it once or twice before I actually pick it up and again that's just something that comes with it um, but I'm very lucky as well there's a lot of a lot of girls here with perfect English and they are always very very quick to help me when I need it yeah, they put us to shame, don't they, really, with their linguist skills. Speaking of um, movements and positions, you recently lined out in midfield for the Irish team, uh, something I never thought I'd see. But uh, how was that? How did that come about? How, talk well, to me about that. To, to be honest with you, I think um, <laughs> it was very funny because I had that conversation with Vera and Anya and Claire Walsh, and a few of them were sitting in one of the tables over and they were just like, oh, what was, what was that about? And I said, girls, she wants to try me in midfield. And I'll just say, on you give me a look as if to say, you're a lot of things, but you're not a midfielder. So, and she may have said a few colourful things as well. But honestly, that I think that was it. I think... It was a great game was, to be part of. You're going to go where you're put in a game like that, obviously, happily. Yeah, and I, I was very lucky. I had Katie behind me and I had Denise beside me. And... With them two, you know, one of the things Vera said to me, she goes, just do exactly what Denise tells you to do. And the thing is, Denise never stops talking the whole game. And for me, it was just like, I was just so concentrated. Just don't go out of position. Just stay put. If you're told to go left, go left. If you're told to go right, go right. And just, and I don't think, it, you know, for someone that went in for the first time, I don't think it was the worst game I ever played. I didn't give away any goals, which was the number one aim. Um, but yeah, it was like, to be honest, it was a complete, a complete shock. But you know yourself, like you played left back mm. a couple of years ago and you know that when you're asked to go somewhere, you'll do it. Um, so I was I was very happy to play and, you know, maybe maybe not a future um, in the midfield. Just yeah, yet. I remember uh, Colin put me in, in the 10, I think, against Norway and then absolutely slated me for my positional sense the whole analysis after. I was like, sound, sound. <laughs> um, but that's an interesting point. Obviously, the team now has a really good balance of kind of leaders. You spoke about Katie and Denise and you've got Neve Fahey. You kind of have that on-field coaching as well. The The balance of the team seems to have just kind of settled in, in the last few games um, and in the squad, you feel like anyone can kind of slot in. Um, have you felt like there's been a shift? Obviously, there was a long period where we hadn't won a match and then we've had three pretty good performances um, in recent times. What, what has been the shift? Is it a shift in mood? Is it just getting used to each other now after a year together? Yeah, to be honest, Karen, like it's, I don't think it's been one set thing that's just like magically changed. But like I know from when we were in the last camp that we did all talk about um, Iceland. And mm. Iceland for me was like the bottom, the bottom of the barrel because obviously we had a terrible run of defeats coming into that. Yes, against very good opposition, but whether you're losing eight games to eight of the best teams or eight of the worst teams, losing is still not a really, really nice place to be. And I think the, the mood of the camp wasn't good. You know, obviously going to play Iceland, also end of season. Most mm. people are thinking about their holidays. I was thinking about my holiday. And I just think when we came in then to Australia, there was just a kind of like a new lease of life. And I think then obviously with the results against Australia, that just again, I think it just showcased showcase to the girls it's like yeah we've had a difficult run but we are still capable of getting really positive results and like at the end of the day confidence is such an important factor of this and I think taking the confidence from that going in then the mood in the camp has been so much different in comparison to the previous camps and I even said this to the girls last camp I feel there's like there is a togetherness that even if you don't play you still feel like you're so valued that if, you know you might not get any minutes but you may be needed for one and you still feel as important as someone else who's not playing and I think that's uh, to have that and so that you know yourself it's a fantastic group of players the girls are great there's you know the humor and everything is so important and you know I think that really has taken us now to the next level and I think you also have to mention the return of the crowd um, I think that the home playing back in Tala with the atmosphere the feeling and obviously now we feel, yeah, we can compete and we can win games. And as soon as you start winning again, the feeling is completely different. So 
I'd say there's not just one set reason why things have shifted. I think it's probably collective, um, but it, it's it's been brilliant now. I must say the last couple of counts have been really excellent. You talked there a bit about like when you were feeling quite low and you said after like when you were home the last time that you found like bits of the season quite frustrating in terms of like your playing time and I've listened to a few interviews you've done before and you're very you've always seemed very big on like personal responsibility and turning around and saying like I played bad in that match and it's not something you actually get from a lot of footballers a lot of sports people all the time when you are feeling in that sort of low place and maybe things aren't going as well at the club level, like how do you then bring yourself up for say a camp like the Australia one where is it just you come in and because everyone else is in a good way, you're kind of bouncing off that and it's that whole sort of team thing or what were the steps that you took yourself through beforehand? Yeah, that's like, that is a really good question because I do feel that a lot of the time when things aren't going well for you and you know obviously it can be a club or it can be international that again as I said confidence for me is the most important thing that any player can have when any player has it they're on top of the world but when they don't have it they're a completely different person and player altogether I think honestly going in I just used to set small targets of obviously we've been the way the camps have kind of been set up it's been I think in between league games it's been like three four weeks in between most um the last couple of camps so I just used to set four week targets, get through this week, get through the next week, get through the next week. And then obviously at, at the end of the day for my club wanting to play at the weekend, then if I didn't play, it's like, right, you didn't play last game. But, you know, this weekend, this week, have a really good week in training. And then hopefully then, you know, you can take that. But as I said, the group in the Irish camp are fantastic. And it was a sense of I felt that when I went in, you know, a few people were like, oh, you know, I've seen that you have been getting a lot of game time and. And then you speak to people and then other people then will say, well, this is what I found really useful for me. Uh, I think it was even Diane that said it to me that she was like, you have to kind of set yourself a little goal every week. If it's a good week of training, that's a goal and you've accomplished that goal. And then the next week you relook at it. Um, it's not been easy. I will say that. Like it's not, you can't, at the end of the day, all we do is want, we want to play. You want to be, you want to start, you want to finish. And if you don't do that, you want to get as much time as you can. Uh, and when you can't get that, it's obviously it is difficult. So I think there's definitely been weeks where I've been, you know, really good, really easy to manage it. But then there's obviously weeks then it is a little bit more difficult. Yeah, that's a really kind of mature outlook. And you obviously went abroad after you'd you'd finished college and stuff. Um, from my opinion, I think that that would stand to you. I think the transition, if you'd gone at 18, you might not have been able to handle something like that, not playing and things like that. But you obviously have that maturity and a bit more experience, even even just playing the women's national league and and up in the Irish team, um, to be able to manage that and and that can come with age. So it's it's nice that Diane can pass on her knowledge to you and you can kind of do that to some of the younger girls as well who maybe have gone abroad and and it hasn't been as instant a success as as they maybe had expected because you're a big big fish in in Ireland and and people talk about you and stuff and it, it can be hard then the transition but you seem to have managed it very well just in yourself which is a big compliment to you yeah I think that it's as you said I still 100% back that the most important thing was getting through college first because I didn't want to be somebody who and of course people take different paths all the time I didn't want to be somebody who went away and did this and by the time I'm 19 20 21 saying oh I don't like it you come back and then it's like Right now, you have to go through the process of going through your college and it can take three or four years or even if you don't want to do that, what do you want to do? And I think just having that initial goal, because I knew, you know, at the end of the day, I won't be playing football forever. So you also need that. I think the security net would be the best way to describe it. But I think, as you said, there's just it's interesting when you speak to different people, because I think if you look right now, probably somebody who last year probably had a really difficult time of it was Leanne. And then you look at her now and she's just after getting the player of the month for the, for the WSL too. And again, it's just confidence and form does come back, but it is, obviously it's really difficult when you don't have it. And I think when you see that, that's something that first time you see, obviously then you speak to Katie and Katie always said about Arsenal that when she went up to Glasgow for six months was the best decision she made, get the confidence back. And then suddenly then a new manager wants to keep her involved. So as you said, when you speak to different people and you get different things as much as you, you might say yeah you have a little bit of your own knowledge but at the end of the day speaking and learning in different ways is also very helpful 
Do okay, you so when are you, you coming back to payment? <laughs> I was literally about to ask that. <laughs> I, I, I will not lie to you. If you actually seen the amount of times my mom, if there's a weekend I don't play or I don't play too well, she's like, do you think you could go back to payment at this, at the, at this rate? And Oh, God. Dennis would love to see you back anyway. I would love. Do you know what? You'd miss it. Yeah. I'll, t- I'll tell you, though. You wouldn't have missed it last week. <laughs> no, that's what I was just going to say to you. I don't, I don't think I would have been able to survive that. No, I must no. say. You might not have been able to take all your like mature, calming words of how to no. get through dark times. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Triggered. Triggered would be the word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, like, but could you see yourself coming back at some stage to play in the Women's National League or like is staying in Germany the sort of thing that you would see for your future? Like, I don't think you can ever rule out coming back because, again, I'm somebody who is a big believer and you have to take things day by day because if you'd have told me three years ago I'd spend three years in Germany playing two years in the Bundesliga and one year in the second league, I probably wouldn't have thought it was going to happen. So I think that you have to take things as they come and I certainly would never, ever rule out going back to Paymount because they always said that once you leave Paymount, you just magically find your way coming back to it as well. It happened. It, <laughs> it does to the best of them. It does. I just took a little hiatus for two years. Hiatus. Unsuccessful. Unsuccessful hiatus. hiatus. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and what has been, I suppose, the biggest thing you've taken from playing in Germany? Because I think it's probably a route, especially on the women's side, that not a lot of people go down. It's probably England or the States is a much more trodden path than going to mainland Europe. Yeah, to be honest, like I think when I'm in it, in it at the minute and like how I see it, I don't. I'm probably not as aware of the differences as it would be if I've been to a couple of different places and then could compare it. I think that there's a real, there is a huge physicality element in, in Germany. I definitely would say that. I think when you go through all, you know, you go through the players and the standard of players here. There's, they're just athletes. Majority of them are just soul athletes. They're just, they're strong, they're lean. Um, the Germans love their running, their endurance running, their long running. And I think you've seen that collection of physicality between that and now I think the football standards are improving. I think that, you know, from comparing the Germans when we played them in Ireland as well in December, that you know the standard of them is is second to none like yeah. they learn at a really they, they learn at a young age which someone like me didn't really learn until I got older because I suppose coaching standards and I suppose access to things like I think the difference in female players to Ireland to here is huge like there's a huge gulf and I think just it's the basics of that I think the foundations of teams starts much much younger and they just build on it then and they build on it and they build on it and then suddenly they come to 18, 19 and you have these technically brilliant footballers who've been, you know, really, really well coached. And I think that's just the gap that one of the gaps that I would say we would need to close. Hopefully we close it more and more in the coming years. Uh, Amber, that's all the time we have, but thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, that's Perfect. It. That's us for this week's Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports in association with Cabri FC, official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland's women's national team. Um, Karen and I will be back next Tuesday with all the biggest news and talking points from across the weekend's games and, of course, Emma's team of the week. Uh, if you have any comments, thoughts, that questions that you want, please do get into this at off the ball, hashtag OTB Koi Gig Pod. Uh, and Karen, you can go back to drowning Dead. in the show. Back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us this week and we will see you next tuesday thanks Mel. thanks very much <laughs>